Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. Welcome back to So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino, and today we have a returning guest on the show, David Hudson. David, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. David is, of course, an assistant professor of law at Belmont University and a legal fellow here at FIRE. And we also have a first-time guest on the show, FIRE's very own general counsel, Ronnie London. Ronnie, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for giving me a spin on this, Nico. (laughs) Ronnie is also a former First Amendment litigator at the law firm of Davis Wright Tremaine. Okay, gentlemen, I want to jump right into it. We're covering the Supreme Court on this podcast, and yesterday the court heard oral argument in 303 Creative v. Elenis. This is kind of a piggyback case on the Masterpiece Cake Shop case that the court, at least many allege, punted on uh, the the last time uh, they addressed the issue. That was in 2018. The facts of this case are similar. We have Lori Smith, who owns a graphic design firm in Colorado and offers custom wedding websites for customers. But because she opposes same-sex marriage for religious reasons, she does not want to create custom websites for same-sex weddings which violates a Colorado public accommodation law that prohibits businesses from discriminating against gay people or announcing their intention to do so. So the case is up at the Supreme Court, and the issue is whether applying a public accommodation law to compel an artist or speaker to speak or stay silent violates the free speech clause of the First Amendment. David, you said you read the transcript from the oral argument yesterday. What would you think? Well, I thought both lawyers had a tough time. It was uh, as typical of Supreme Court arguments. It was a vigorous line of questioning. Uh, Kristen Wagoner, who argued the case for Lori uh, Smith, the petitioner, yeah, she faced some very vigorous questioning, particularly from Justice Sonia Sotomayor, um, essentially about, well, if she doesn't want to design a website for persons in a same sex marriage, what about persons in an interracial marriage? Uh, Justice Jackson and Justice Kagan were also quite uh, vigorous in their questioning. And I think part of of what the court has to do from from looking at the briefing is the court going going to view this truly as the compulsion of speech? Is this an, another uh, in a long line of, of compelled speech cases? Is it is it similar to uh, forcing the Maynards to display a uh, uh, live free or die on their license plate? Is it similar to the the Hurley case uh, where the gay and lesbian group uh, sought inclusion in a, uh, in, in, a in a private parade? Uh, or is it purely commercial conduct? Uh, and so you have the United States government and, and others arguing that this case really involves commercial conduct more so than speech. Uh, and so one reason why I think you're entirely accurate uh, that this case will, I think, force the court to address some of the underlying speech issues that they did punt on in, in Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, does this involve speech or is it conduct? Is it really the regulation of commercial conduct or is it pure speech compulsion? And the speech conduct dichotomy is is one that uh, permeates a lot of, of First Amendment law. You know, I, I go back to Cohen v. California, even, you know, the celebrated F the draft case back in 1971, where the majority in opinion by Justice John Marshall Harlan II, you know, famously said, of course, this is pure speech, right? You're trying to to cleanse uh, the vocabulary of the, of the F word. What did Justice Blackman say in his dissenting opinion that Cohen's immature anic was mainly conduct and little speech. You know, when when uh, when the court addressed Virginia v. Black, the, the burning of a cross, right? What did Justice Thomas write in his his dissent? He said the act of burning a cross was was conduct, not speech. So I, I think that, that, that sort of speech versus conduct uh, dichotomy is something that'll be very interesting to see how the court treats that. Yeah, but they weren't selling crosses, right, Ronnie? I mean, yeah, well, so- you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me uh, that you mention uh, the dissent in the cross burning case, right? It was Justice Thomas's dissent in the cross burning case where he said, "No, that's just conduct. 
yeah, that's the dissent. Um, and, th- and this is something that's frustrated me a bit about the discourse on Masterpiece Cakes and on this case as well. Um, the parties below really didn't dispute whether uh, Smith's pre- preparation and creation of uh, bespoke websites for for weddings was speech. I don't I don't think there's any question about that. And, and I and frankly I found that a little bit frustrating in Masterpiece Cakes as well. Uh, there was a lot of debate uh, leading up to the argument, and even at the argument in that case, you know, are cakes you know speech or are they not speech? Anyone who has a mixed interest in baking shows and legal doctrine should check out the cake makers brief, uh, amicus brief in that case because it's one of the most beautiful briefs you'll ever see with all of the with all of the illustrations in it. But what was interesting in that case is there was a finding at the Colorado Commission that the cake was expressive. And I know that you get de novo review in First Amendment cases. You get an independent review of the record. But at the end of the day, there was a finding. Nobody bothered to say, hey, I'm looking at this case in a de novo way. I'm looking at and taking an independent review of the record. And here's why I think the cake isn't expressive. Nobody did that. They just simply continued to debate the point. And I found that a little bit frustrating because I think that was one of the reasons, and this is just my speculation, of course, that the court punted on the speech issue because it was kind of a difficult speech issue if you don't accept the finding in the record. Here in this case, the question of whether this is commercial conduct or whether this is compelled speech, I think that's a question. I don't think there's any underlying question, though, of whether Smith is engaged in speech when she creates these bespoke websites. And so, you know, the analogy that I've seen is uh, they say, okay, well, there's a difference between uh, holding yourself out to the public in a commercial venture versus engaging in speech. And when you do the former, that is justification for, in some cases, compelling you to provide services in a non-discriminatory way. And the analogy I've seen in some places is you know, there's a difference between Annie Leibovitz as a photographer who decides what she wants to shoot, who she wants to work for, what the shoots are going to be, and the Sears Photo Studio. Now, I would say that's not the true spectrum. I would say the spectrum is maybe Annie Leibovitz and a photo booth at your local roller rink, right? Because the we can say for sure the roller rink photo booth is not creating speech you know, I don't want to uh, besmirch the artistry of some of those who may work at the Sears Photo Studio, but but I take the point, right? Everyone's coming in, everyone's getting the blue backdrop, the camera's set up the same for everyone. Get your family in front of the camera, we'll take the pictures, you know, how many wallet size do you want? That's different from, you know, a, a professional photographer who might take assignments on a private basis. So the argument is 303 Creative has opened to the public, they provide these services, yeah, the services might involve some speech, but because they're open to the public, they can't turn away people on the basis of who they are. But that's not really a fair reading of the record either, because Smith isn't turning away people based on who they are. Any, any gay couple can come in if they've got a youth softball league and want a website for it. They'll happily, she'll happily do that. If they want to come in and have a website designed for pretty much anything other than a wedding or anything other than celebrating their marriage, the, the, the studio will provide that service. But if you want to compel me to say something about your marriage, which ergo is saying something about same-sex marriage, that goes against my religious beliefs, and I can't be compelled to say that. And I, and I think- So the distinction you're making there, Ronnie, is you know you can't not provide these services to someone because they are gay, but you you don't have to provide them if it's for a gay wedding, which isn't a status based determination. Right, it's, and that and that's and that's the nub of the issue in this case, right? It is, um, you know, are you denying service based on who they are, or are you denying service based on the speech you're being compelled to voice? But and, but you're denying them service based on what they do because they of who they are is that what makes it so complicated and where you know how do you draw that line let's go back to masterpiece cakes okay because i think it helps illuminate this very issue a little bit better than sure. than 303 creative does 
when the couple walked into the into the bakery, and, and actually, as a matter of fact, the one of the mothers of one of the members of the couple walked into the in the bake shop and said, "We want this cake for you know this gay wedding. We want you to create one of your bespoke cakes," and he refused to provide it. He said, "Look, there anything else in the store you want? Any of these standard wedding cakes? Any uh, you, you want cookies? You want brownie? Whatever you we happen to have here." But for the service that I provide of creating a wedding cake specifically for your wedding using my voice, my creative talents, that I won't do for a gay wedding. And I think similarly with 303 Creative, as I understand the record, Smith isn't turning away same-sex couples for services generally. She's not turning away you know, services for anything other than I won't do a wedding website because... Speaking positively on same-sex weddings is inconsistent with my religious beliefs, and I don't want to voice that idea. I, rem- I remember in Masterpiece, right, they said that the gay couple who came in and requested a cake could get, like, a, a standard cake that wasn't custom-made for their wedding. Um, That's right. That's right. What is, is, are the facts, as alleged in this 303 Creative case, similar insofar as, like, do, does Lori Smith make template websites that they're free to use versus the custom ones where she actually has to create the message. Uh, that I don't know. Although I believe the entirety of her business is I create custom, custom. websites for you. But he, but to your point, um, if a if a if a you know more traditional couple walked in to her studio and said we're already married, one man, one woman, you know that's what your religion says is required. We want to hire you to create a website for my brother's wedding. He's marrying uh, a, a, another man and we want you to create that for us. Her answer would still be no, as I understand their argument, right? It's not a matter of who you're providing the service to. It's what the service will say and putting those words into my mouth, so to speak, that I have a religious, or, and it doesn't matter, quite frankly, whether it's a religious compunction or a matter of conscience. I mean, that's, you know, you'll note that the court only granted cert on the free speech question presented in this case. Well, that's what I was going to ask because they punted on masterpiece, right? By getting to the religious, uh, the free exercise question, they didn't address the free speech question. So they've, if I hear you correctly, Ronnie, you're essentially saying that's not a question in this case. So they can't use that vehicle to punt on it, right? I would like to say that. I don't speak in absolutes. I mean, you're talking about people with lifetime appointment, appointments with no judicial review above them. They can do whatever they want. <laughs> yes. As, as a matter of structure and as a matter of, of you know, principled approach to the case, I, I agree with that. I, I think part of the difficulty was the, the line of questioning when they, uh, they asked, well, what if you had a couple who was an interracial couple and they, were, they, they have an interracial marriage? Could the designer refuse to design their website because they have some sort of religious or other objection to uh, interracial marriages. Uh, yeah, and that was a question that there really was not, I don't think, a very good answer to. Now, part of that was because they got cut off and thing, but that that's always the, the, the struggle, right? You know, uh, uh, David, do you think that there wasn't a good answer to that question because, and I'll let you do multiple choice here and you can have D all or some of the above, but because they got cut off, because there is an answer, but the litigant didn't want to say it because it is a difficult fact to swallow, or C, there really isn't an answer to the question that aligns itself with either of the sides in this case or the potential outcomes. I think all the above, although mainly A, they got cut off. (laughs) So what, um, so what do you think the answer is on and, that? And part, part of well, part of the part of the problem, I think, is in society, right? Uh, Loving versus Virginia back in whatever 1967, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously ruled that a state law prohibiting interracial marriages flagrantly violated the Equal Protection Clause. That was nine to zero. Fast forward to 2015 in Obergefell, that was a five four decision. Uh, and so I, t- I think that there is a uh, well, didn't they? Wasn't there a discussion in the oral argument where um, the Colorado Solicitor General said that there is a difference between opposition to same-sex marriage and interracial marriage, uh, or there is no difference, I should say, between opposition to same-sex marriage and interracial marriage? And the Obergefell opinion 
uh, itself held that people can oppose the former for honorable, non-bigoted reasons. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, like there is no dissent in loving. There was a there were several dissenting opinions in Oberkerfell, but it, but it is a it is a challenging question, I think, and and one that I, I agree with Ronnie. You know, she got cut off before she could really answer it, and then when she tried to answer it, she got cut off again multiple times, and finally they moved on to moved on to something hey, else. Hey, David, really, really quick. Hold on, Ronnie. David, really quick. I think you're clanging some change there that will pick, get oh, picked up in the sorry. audio. So if you could uh, <laughs> sit on your hands there, David. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting point you pick on, up on, Nico, about, you know, you can oppose uh, same-sex weddings for honorable reasons, but not, you know, interracial marriages. For that, that's what the court said. That's what Kennedy said in Oberto. Right, right. That's no, not and, what I'm it's, and it's a good, it's good point for you to pick up on. Um you know, I have said um, in some ways, whether it's this case or whether it was Bremerton last term or whether it was Shirtliff last term, in some ways, it's almost unfortunate that these cases have this religious overlay uh, running through them. Because when you get to the free speech side of it, um, you know, it should present, I think, cleaner issues. And, and one, you know, I didn't get to read the transcript or listen to the argument. I did uh, running from appointment to appointment yesterday, get to you know pop my uh, you know my, my my virtual head in for about twenty minutes, and what I heard of the questioning, and it was um, to the ADF lawyer, there is a part of this case where the, the the ramifications of some of these positions do become troubling, much in the same way that. If you say, okay, we're going to protect hate speech, and if it doesn't rise to the level of true threat, it doesn't rise to the level of incitement, there's some really awful stuff that that means is going to be allowed. And here, I think that if you play each of these positions all the way out, it does get you to edge cases that are troubling. For example, I mean, I wouldn't expect that people would support, or at least the majority of people would support saying, you know, I can find myself the best little bakery in Crown Heights in the Orthodox neighborhood and go in and say, hey, I want this cake made. Um, I want the side decorations to be swastikas and that the baker should have to do that because he's open to the public. Right. I mean, if the baker's opposed to that for whether it's moral reasons, religious reasons, conscious reasons, we don't compel that speech much in the same way. But that's not apples to apples. Right, Ronnie. I mean, uh, you're not asking for the swastikas because of your like protected characteristic, right? Well, now hold on a second. See, and that's why I say it's unfortunate that there are these religious overlays in the case, because for example, if the establishment clause means anything, one of the things that it has to mean, and, and I think the jurisprudence supports this is we don't have a litmus test for what's a legitimate religion. If you truly believe and you act in, 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 in comport with what you believe, the government doesn't get to say this is an okay religion, this is not okay religion. You know, if the, it wasn't the, ca- the case that the government was saying, um, yeah, it's legitimate to do small animal sacrifice in your backyard. It's not legitimate to have a religion that requires you to use peyote, right? There was none of that normative judgment. And if I say my religious beliefs are, you know, the Teutonic, Aryan, blue, you know, blue haired, uh, blue eyed, you know, blonde haired race, master race, and that's, I built a religion around it. And I want service based on that. We under the establishment clause, you can't say, well, that's not a legitimate re- religion. Therefore, it's not a characteristic that we protect as a protected category. So, I mean, yes, I could probably, if I sat here long enough, come up with a better hypothetical that doesn't raise that. But I, but I think you take the point is that you would be foisting on people stuff that would be really offensive to them that I think you would be able to find a, ma- a vast majority of people would think is, gosh, that that's really an awful outcome. Much in the same way, it says, well, what if your religious beliefs were that you didn't believe in interracial marriage? Could you refuse service for that wedding website? Again, if you accept that we're not going to put a litmus test on religious belief, then yes, I think that you have to be principled about the application of the standards here. And it's an awful outcome, but... There, there isn't a very comfortable way to distinguish it, which is why I was wondering, David, what you thought the the answer to that question could or should have been uh, if it had not been cut off. 
Yeah, it's a difficult question for me to answer. Uh, being in an interracial marriage, frankly, um, you know, <laughs> I, I don't. That that's the part of you know the intersection of public accommodation law and, and free speech is is troubling. Um, uh, you know, part of me is like, if you open your services up to the general public, you you ought to serve people and not deny them based on based on who they are. On the but, other but, hand, yeah, on the I other agree. hand. On the other hand, on the other hand, I, I do see the pure speech compulsion argument here. It, it is compelled speech, uh, so I struggle with it, frankly. Yeah, yeah. and that's the uh, hardest thing when you're talking about free speech. Is I mean, none of my examples here necessarily reflect my personal beliefs one way or the other. It's very hard to put that aside, and that's why I think that that question becomes a very difficult question because either you have to come up with a standard that you know may not hold up very well, or you have to accept a horrible outcome. But nevertheless, it's the principled outcome. It's 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 tough. That's what that's one of the reasons this case is so so tough. Well, that's one of the case, reasons that free speech work is so so tough, right? I mean, so okay, three hundred three creative gentlemen. Where do you think it's going to come down? Six three as everyone's been anticipating. Masterpiece Cake Shop was seven two, right? Written by written by Kennedy on um, religious grounds. But I, you know, from what I've heard, again, I haven't gotten to listen to the whole thing. Um, just based on you know prior decisions and the, the commentary I've seen thus far today, that sounds more or less right to me. It's certainly going to be divided. There's no no chance in bleak for a unanimous opinion. Well, I do want to turn next. <laughs> I, I want to turn next to um, Shirtleff v. City of Boston, which was a case that was decided on May second of this year, so last term. Ronnie pulled me aside this morning and said we should maybe pivot from 303 Creative into the government speech doctrine cases. Well, it's more about the religious through line on these cases. Right? Okay, okay, because I was like, Ronnie, you're going to have to explain to me what the connection is on the government speech doctrine uh, side between those cases. But yes, there is a religious through line. So let's start with Shirtliff v. City of Boston, then move to Kennedy v. Bremerton, which was decided later in last term. Um, the City of Boston as you guys know, rejected an application to fly a Christian flag on one of three flagpoles in front of City Hall in Boston. Uh, the city program had allowed other flags from private groups to fly on those flagpoles. Um, and the court held here that they could not, the city of Boston could not deny the Christian group the right to fly the flag as well. And Aaron, our uh, editor, I hope you will, for our video viewers, put up a picture of the flag. I believe it's a white flag with a uh, red cross where the stars would normally go on in uh, American stars and stripes. The group that wanted to put it up was called Camp's Constitution. It was a 9-0 decision written by Breyer. So whereas the last case we're thinking is definitely going to be a split decision, why was the court so unanimous in Shirtliff v. City of Boston and why is this important case for the First Amendment? Uh, David, let's let's start with you on that one. Well, I think it's very important because the court, in my mind, has has recognized, as Justice Alito warned in Matal v. Tam back in 2017, that the government speech doctrine is a doctrine that is susceptible to dangerous misuse. Uh, it can be used uh, as a she as a camouflage for flagrant viewpoint discrimination. In in here, you had a case where in Shirtliff there were hundreds of private groups that were allowed to fly their flags, uh, but when Harold Shirtliff wanted to fly Camp Constitution's flag that had you know a lot of religious content, um, was denied, and so you you had a case where. The city of Boston, I think, committed viewpoint discrimination based on the religious content and religious viewpoint of of his speech. So, well, uh, David, David, we've talked about the margin case in the last one. You know, interracial marriage, for example, someone refusing service because they oppose interracial marriage. Let's go to the margin here. Is the outcome of this case mean that the American Nazi Party must be allowed to fly their swastika flag in front of the city hall at Boston? Well. The court was very cautious. Breyer was very cautious to explain that a city could easily set up a system um, where flying flagpoles, they, they do not create a designated public forum, right? Um, it was just by policy and practice here, the city of Boston had opened this up repeatedly to different groups. And so... And if you open it up, you cannot discriminate based on viewpoint according to the holding in this decision. That, that's, that, that's part of it, certainly. But I, I think the great part of it for First Amendment advocates 
is is the cutback on the application of the government speech doctrine. Um, you know, we look at you know recent government speech cases, and the court unanimously held in Pleasant Grove v. Summum back in two thousand nine that monuments in a public park were government speech. That may make sense because you're dealing with limited space there, and a monument in a public park may be government speech. But then we somehow get to 2015 in Walker v. Sons of Confederate Veterans, where somehow five members of the court found that a that a specialty license plate was was government speech, even though as Justice Alito, who wrote Pleasant Grove v. Summum, he wrote the primary dissent in Walker. He said, "Look, if you see a car driving down the road with a specialty plate, you associate." that more with the owner of the vehicle as opposed to the government. Uh, and then he also wrote Matal v. Tam. And, and the government speech doctrine has even been used by a couple courts, including the Indiana Supreme Court in Vauter in 2015 and a recent federal district court in Hawaii to somehow find that vanity plates are a form of government speech. Uh, I admit that I'm a little biased here because I have a vanity plate case here in Tennessee uh, we had a three-judge chancery court somehow find that vanity plates are a form of government speech, which is ridiculous because a vanity plate, what's another name for a vanity plate? It's a personalized plate. So the, the, real, the real thing we need to worry about is a very broad application of the government speech doctrine, because if something is deemed to be government speech, it ends the First Amendment analysis, and that's very troubling. Um, and the government can use that as an end run around the most fundamental of all free speech principles, which is the government should not be discriminating against private speakers. And uh, to your question about, yeah, there's going to be some hateful expression out there. There is, but hate speech is protected unless it falls into recognized categorical exceptions like the true threat doctrine, fighting words, or incitement to imminent lawless action. Uh, but you know that that leads to mind what what Chief Justice Roberts wrote in. Uh, Snyder v. Phelps, right? Speech is powerful. It may move us to both tears of joy and sorrow, but we do not react to that pain by punishing the speaker. We allow uh, we allow a lot of ha- uh, harmful speech on on public issues because that's what we've chosen as a nation, right? To allow freedom of speech on on public issues, and that's that's important for us as First Amendment advocates to recognize that um, the First Amendment does protect a lot of unsavory expression. Ronnie, do you have any additional thoughts on this one? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with all that. I mean, I, you know, I find myself in Alito's camp on this one. Um, Did he write a concurring opinion? He well, he wrote a concurring opinion in 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 Shirtliff. He wrote, as, as David mentioned, the dissent in, in Walker, um, and, and probably the concurring opinion in Shirtliff is the most cogent uh, discussion of. The government speech doctrine, as I've seen, because it boils down to, for Justice Alito, who, as you note, wrote the majority opinion in Summum, where which was our first big government speech case, right? And he comes back in Walker and says, "No, no, no, you guys are getting this all wrong." And in Mattel, he's like, "You know, really don't go there." Um, and so now he comes along with this this concurrence and says, "Look, those three factors that we made use of in the prior cases, you know, that that wasn't supposed to be a test." Those were three things that we considered in the totality of circumstances that were convenient in those cases. But at the end of the day, what they all really boiled down to is, is it the government speaking? Is it a person imbued with the authority of government to be issuing a message? Is it the government's message? If it is, then it's the government's speech, which is why, by the way, the license plate case cases, like you say, David, whether it's the personalized plates or the um, specialized plates, right? Those are more associated with the driver of the car. The government doesn't say anything. We don't think that the, you know the government of Texas necessarily endorses every single specialized plate message that it allows to, to be issued. And the other factor for Alito is, and in the exercise of the government official speaking or the government representative speaking the government's message, are they doing so in a way that doesn't suppress anyone else's speech, because then you've slid into not government speech, but government regulation. And and I think that, and I hope that, that will be the test that the courts come to think of and use when they're trying to decide something is government speech. And this is another case where I say it's a little bit unfortunate that there was a religious overlay because it really doesn't have anything to do with religion, right? I could have gone up to Boston and said, you know, 
I want, I want to fly my kiss army flag up today. You know, I'm going to have some of my people over and face paint and I want to take a picture in the kiss. And if the Boston would have said, those guys are hooligans, you know, everyone else we've, we've flown has been, you know, pure and, you know, uh, had the best of intentions. And that's just a rock band who does awful things. We're not going to allow that. It's very easy to see that as viewpoint discrimination, which is why, by the way, you get to, once you get over the government speech hurdle in this case, you get to a 9-0 vote, right? Because it's very obviously d- viewpoint discrimination. And, you know, I think that it becomes clearer when you remove the religious element out of it. And it's unfortunate that the uh, Boston City Hall personnel said, oh, I've got this view of the Establishment Clause. That means I have to do something different here. And I think the court was clear in Shirtliff saying that's not what it's about. It's being pro-religious is a viewpoint. It doesn't matter that it's pro-religion versus, you know, pro-solar power or anything else. If you're going to say, no, that's the one viewpoint we're not going to allow. And, you know, this is a forum that's just not going to fly. The reason why this is so important, right, is if you're an attorney for the government, I mean, you try to argue government speech whenever you can, right? Because you fend off very difficult First Amendment arguments if, if it's government speech. That's why these cases are so important, you know. I'm sorry if I'm writing a, a law review article for Fire Now on the on the government speech doctrine and, and, and Justice Alito's different opinions because it's so important. You know, I, I've seen cases where, the government speech doctrine, I think, is misapplied. And when the government speech doctrine is misapplied, the, the harm to the First Amendment is egregious. Because it because as Alito said, it has slid into censorship, right? It's no longer the government's message. It's government power. And much in the same way, David, and you, you see this with government attorneys also, I am very troubled, and I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but I'm very troubled with the speech incident to criminal conduct exception to the First Amendment. Because government always argues that. They always argue oh, all we're regulating is communication about something illegal and therefore it's speech incident. Um, And more often than not, they're actually regulating the speech. And I'm like, look, if you can get to aiding and abetting and you can get to conspiracy, well, by all means, go forward and charge that. But don't regulate the speech or punish the speech if you don't clear those high hurdles simply because it's allegedly speech incident. That's another favorite government argument. And I agree with you that government speech gets abused the same way. I think post gibbony ought to be another podcast because I totally agree with you that that, that is a, a sort of unprotected category that hasn't been fleshed out and narrowed significantly enough like some of the others. And I'd make another great podcast, frankly. Well, maybe we do that one down the line. For uh, this one, I want to stick to the cases in at the Supreme Court in, in, in 2022 here. And I want to pivot now to a case where perhaps the religious overtones do matter for how the case got decided. I'm talking here about Kennedy v. Bremerton School District. For those of you who aren't familiar with this case, it uh, involved a coach, uh, Coach Kennedy, at a Washington State high school who would periodically pray at the 50-yard line uh, after football games. Uh, the In 2015, he had been a part-time coach at the school for seven years, and he would sometimes be joined with students, uh, by students, to pray at the 50-yard line. But when the school district learned about Kennedy's prayers, it expressed disapproval, and Kennedy briefly stopped praying. Um, but he picked it back up again uh, later. He notified the school before he was going to do so. Uh, and the school alleged that as a result of his prayers, there was some, and, and the facts in this case are, so, are are somewhat in dispute, but the school alleged that it was a chaotic scene, uh, spectators, reporters getting knocked over as members of the band and players tried to join him at um, mid midfield. The court in that case held, and I'm looking for my notes here. It was in a 6-3 decision by Gorsuch that the free exercise and free speech clauses of the First Amendment protect an individual, in this case, Coach Kennedy, uh, engaging in personal religious observance um, from government reprisal. The government cannot punish them for doing so. Uh, the Constitution neither mandates nor permits the government to suppress such religious expression. Now, of course, the school argued that this was sort of an establishment of the religion, which violates one of the five freedoms in the First Amendment. Six, if you f- see free exercise and establishment as two separate rights protected under uh, the Constitution. But I want to get your guys' take on the outcome of this case. Coach praying at the 50 yard line, joined by prayers, uh, joined by players to pray at a public school. Uh, did the court get it right here? I, I actually want to take an issue with a small point 
that ultimately winds up being an important point in your recitation of the facts. Please do. This is, an, this is another case where acceptance of the record and the findings below, and in this case, it becomes the whole ball game, is a bit of an issue. The parties agreed below that Kennedy was punished for only the last three instances when he when he prayed at the 50-yard line, which he did during the break between the end of the game and when his coaching duties resume. So that is in a in a, in a break from being on duty as a, a high school coach, you know, a public, you know, public employee. And this becomes the centerpiece of the majority decision. Right. Where you where you say, OK, this isn't about the coercion of the kids who might have surrounded him on previous prayers. This isn't about the disruption that might have occurred in other instances. This is about the 30 seconds of prayer at the 50 yard line on his own time, while everybody else on staff also and everybody else at the school, for that matter, who's in attendance, was free to mill about and do whatever they wanted to do. If you accept that premise and it is in the record, and, and again, I recognize that in First Amendment cases, you do an independent review. But if you accept that premise, as the majority decision does, this becomes a, a, a fairly straightforward case of viewpoint discrimination against religion, much like in Shirtliff, for much the same reason where you have government officials believing that, oh, I have an establishment clause problem here. I have to stop this. If it had been anything but religion, I wouldn't have done it because that would have been viewpoint discrimination. And, and the the problem with the, with the way this court the court broke on this because you'll see the dissent by Sotomayor takes a very very different view of what these facts actually are. Yeah, and can I just quote that really quick? Yeah, quickly, please. the the dissent: Stephen Breyer, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Mayor complained that Gorsuch had quote misconstrued the facts of the case, um, depicting Kennedy's prayers as quote private and quiet when the players had actually caused quote in their estimation severe disruption. To school events, so very different uh, constru con construing of the facts, right? And so, as a result, you have these very, very divergent decisions because the justices on each side didn't agree to what the factual setting was, which is generally not something you should be getting at the Supreme Court, right? It's, it's yeah. I was going to ask, is that common? It's not a fact finding court. It's not even a court of correction, right? It's a court of deciding legal issues of far reaching implication, and so. You know, and, and by the way, as a result of this, you get a decision where Gorsuch writes that religious speech is doubly protected, which I find very troubling. Um, I think that you also can't have it both ways, right? If in Shirtliff, for example, it's just a matter of you can't take an anti-religion uh, viewpoint as the government, you don't get double protection for religious speech. It's just another viewpoint that gets the same protection and the same entitlement to not being discriminated against. And I think if you look at this case on the three specific instances, and you're able to see that this is basically viewpoint discrimination, because if he had gone to the 50 yard line and done anything else other than pray on those few minutes of his own time in the interregnum between the end of the game and the resumption of his duties, the viewpoint discrimination, much in the same way with Shirtliff, would have been very clear. Um, I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, David. Yeah, I do. And I, I actually ultimately ag agree with the majority opinion, uh, primarily because of its take on Garcetti. So in the lower court, the Ninth Circuit had held that Joseph Kennedy had no free speech rights because he spoke as an employee under Garcetti versus Ceballos, the court's 2006 decision that is a mint of the government speech doctrine where Justice Kennedy said when government employees speak pursuant to their official job duties, the Constitution doesn't insulate them from discipline. Horrific decision that has eviscerated the free speech rights of public employees across the country. And sometimes gets incorrectly applied to uh, college professors. That's one of the another one of the great beauties of fire is to fight back against Garcetti in the academic context. What we're up to four circuits that don't apply Garcetti there. Hopefully it'll be all one day. But this was a case of more of private religious expression than government speech. And for that reason, I do support 
primarily what uh, Justice Gorsuch said with regard to the Ninth Circuit's overextension of Garcetti. That was a win, I think, for First Amendment advocates. The other part, though, is that he uh, overruled the Lemon Test. (laughs) And he said that uh, Lemon v. Kurtzman was the court's 1971 decision that was the primary test used for many years uh, by the Supreme Court to determine whether something violated the Establishment Clause, right? They have a primary purpose, uh, uh, they have a religious purpose instead of a secular purpose, they have a primary effect that doesn't advance or inhibit religion, there's no excessive entanglement. And, uh, you know, Lemon had been mightily criticized through the years. Scalia, back in 1994, called it a nightmarish ghoul that still stalks our Establishment Clause jurisprudence. Um, but, you know, what do we do in place of Lemon? So, Gorsuch overruled Lemon, and he also overruled O'Connor's clarification, that she termed it a clarification, her clarification of uh, the Lemon test, the endorsement analysis that she created back in 1984 in a concurring opinion in Lynch v. Donnelly. So what is the court going to do now in future Establishment Clause cases? That's going to be quite interesting. And Ronnie, I think, hit the nail on the head on the biggest, the biggest question mark is this double protection for religious speech under the free exercise clause and the free speech clause. I don't know if this is a modern iteration of Justice Scalia's hybrid rights and employment division v. Smith, or it's some new creation, or I don't know what it is, but um, I fear with the double protection under the free exercise clause and free speech, and if you overrule Lemon, uh, are we going to see... I mean, is, is there going to be a lot of religious indoctrination going on in the country? You know, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think it's really uh, an open season in the in the religious liberty clauses. But I go back to our government speech thing. I do like the fact that Justice Gorsuch um, basically shot down the Ninth Circuit's overextension of Garcetti. And at FIRE, of course, we appreciate the nod towards the academic freedom or potential academic freedom exception uh, in in, in Garcetti. Um, You know, that was an important point. But I join you on this doubly protected thing. I mean, I've always been telescoping out a little bit. I've always been uncomfortable with this whole, you know, core protected speech or the most protected speech that we have. And then you put political speech up here and, you know, you put new dancing all the way down here and everything else falls between. And now what do you do with religious speech? If it's doubly protected, does it jump up over political speech? I've never, I've never really liked that at all. Either it's, I I view it as binary. Is it protected or not? Otherwise you're just playing normative games, right? And so, I mean, like, for example, in, you know, Virginia Board Pharmacy, as the court said, there are a lot of people out there who care a heck of a lot more whether they can get their life-saving drugs or life-preserving drugs at a good price than they do the most heated political debate of the day. And so to have this hierarchy of speech has always troubled me. And now having some speech be doubly protected or, or more equal than others, so to speak, has always been troubling to me. So I want to move now, recognizing that we've probably got 15, 20 minutes left here. Um, I want to move to the case this term, uh, Gonzalez v. Google, which approaches Section 230. Uh, Section 230, of course, is a protection for online platforms that arises out of the 1996 uh, Communications Decency Act, which protects those platforms from liability uh, for content posted by users on their platforms. But in Gonzalez v. Google, the question is, it was a case uh, filed by the family of an American woman killed in a Paris bistro in an ISIS attack in 2015. Um, They brought a lawsuit under the Anti-Terrorism Act arguing that Google, which owns YouTube, uh, aided ISIS recruitment through YouTube videos. Specifically, they recommended, probably through an algorithm, uh, videos to users uh, that were ISIS videos and that, you know, that sort of recommendation animated ISIS activity and perhaps resulted in the death of, uh, this woman. Uh, so a divided panel of the court of appeals for the ninth circuit ruled that section 230 protects such recommendations, at least if the provider's algorithm treats contents on its website. Similarly, the algorithm, you know, recommends similar content. Similarly, the court did wonder though, and you're starting to see these sorts of um, these sorts of concerns percolate in the political space as well. Whether social media companies should continue to enjoy this sort of immunity for the third party content they publish, and that the court said this is a pressing question that Congress should address 
Ronnie, I think you've worked on uh, Section 230 issues in the past. So what, what is your take? Yeah, so there, there are really two questions there, Nico. I mean, first question is, is 230 really as broad as the courts have interpreted as being, even given the evolution of social media and some of the things that were not even conceivable at the time Section 230 was adopted? The answer to that question may be no. I, I, I think it is. I think it was meant to be that broad, but it, there would be a reasonable mind that could different answer that question no. The second question is, if it is that broad, should Congress do something about it and what should they do? So those those are two questions. I mean, in, in this case, and, and you see that in not only the end of the majority decision in the Ninth Circuit here, but especially in the dissenting decision here and the chief judge of the Second Circuit's deci- uh, dissenting decision in, in Force versus Facebook. But for me, um, at the end of the day, 230, and, and the Ninth Circuit has said this, that boils down to is, are you holding the online service provider, the interactive computer service, liable for the content of a third party? And, you know, they get into a lot of detail in this case about, well, what does the algorithm do? Is it a force multiplier? Uh, does making recommendations for similar content mean that you're really suing the ICS for its own speech in the form of its recommendations and algorithmically trying to figure out what might be similar. So you're saying, well, no, I'm not really suing because of that one ISIS video. I'm suing because, you know, there's a whole bunch of other videos that may or may not be ISIS, but they're all similar and you're pushing them towards these towards people. And that's you doing that. It's not a third party. But I think at the end of the day, no matter which of those views you take, if they weren't terroristic videos, you wouldn't have liability. And there's nothing terroristic in what the algorithm does. It's all about the content that third parties post to the service and make available. And this case is troubling to me because there there are these sentiments and you've seen Justice Thomas's uh, dissents from the denials of cert talking about how Section 230 should not be this broadly construed. I think at one point, even Justice Gorsuch at one point uh, had a had a similar uh, statement, and I'm concerned because I don't know where you draw the line. I think everybody agrees that if all you're doing is providing a search engine to make people uh, able to find stuff that they might be interested on the internet, if that content put up by third parties is problematic, you've got 230 immunity. Then the question is, okay, well, what it, what about when you return the search the search results? If you're prioritizing certain results over others and that content that you've prioritized is problematic, do you get 230 immunity? I think the answer is yes. The case law has developed that way. And then the question becomes, okay, well, now what if your finding and ranking become much more sophisticated and you're able to present recommendations? And I think, in my opinion, those are all of a piece right? At the end of the day, your problem is with the videos that ISIS or ISIS supporters have put up, not anything that the interactive computer services are. And the reason I'm very interested in this case is because if you find what Google did here with respect to its recommendations and the operation of its algorithm falling outside section 230, I don't know where you draw that line working back towards rankings, working back towards search engines, working back towards just the editorial choices of what you present on your website, in which order, in which things you keep off. There's there's another issue in this case at the Ninth Circuit, which I don't think is before the uh, Supreme Court in this case, and that is the Ninth Circuit, even the majority, while it was holding that the recommendations and the presentation of the terroristic content fell within 230, the monetization part did not fall within 230 protection necessarily because that wasn't liability based on the third party content that terrorists posted. That was liability based on Google making payments, sharing advertising revenue with the terrorists and in that way enabling them or facilitating their conduct. Um, Is that alleged that they they actually gave money to these terrorists as a result? Yes, and and I I don't, and and because it's at the motion dismiss stage that is taken as true. Now what the court ultimately decides with that is, the majority that is, decides that 230 doesn't apply, 
Now we have to look at the Anti-Terrorism Act and JASTA and see if there's an aiding and abetting and other, lia- and other liability and ultimately finds that it doesn't. And, that, and that's the question, right? The distinction. The distinction between Google is doing something itself, not simply presenting third-party content, whereas the recommendations are simply presenting the content that is the source of the liability. Yeah, and, and that's what the anti-terrorism question gets to, right? Like there's another case before the court, Twitter v. Uh, Tamney, which doesn't get to the Section 230 question, but asks whether essentially Twitter, quote, knowingly and substantially assisted ISIS in a similar killing, right? And so that's the, and the, and the lower court there, I believe was the Ninth Circuit, said that it, that it did not, right? So is that the distinction, right? You have this algorithm that privileges content based on past user behavior versus Twitter actually going out there and seeing this ISIS content and saying, oh, we want to support them. We want to put more of these videos out because we agree with the viewpoint. You know, I I didn't spend quite as much time on the Twitter side because the court didn't really engage on the on, on the 230 question with respect to Twitter. I mean, if, if ultimately Twitter is doing the same thing that YouTube is doing, and that is simply saying, here's all this third party content. Here's how you find it. Here's how we're going to give you a shortcut to get to it based on what we think your interests are. I mean, to me, all of that is section 230, 230 protected, because that is serving as a publisher. And if you're going to impose liability, you're imposing liability as the publisher of others' content. Yeah, I just wonder, like, so obviously these platforms have content filter moderation uh, tools, but sometimes they're delayed, right? As we saw with the Buffalo shooting, whether it was live streamed by Facebook before it took down, it took it down a minute later. Like, there's just... You know, how do you do? How do you have provide live streaming service without the risk that that sort of thing is going to happen? Um, but there are billions and billions and billions of pieces of content on the internet. Our technology advances every day, but is it ever going to be so advanced where it could prevent, you know, an ISIS beheading video from making it in real quick before it's? You know, it's just I just wonder. Okay, so you get rid of two thirty liability for this stuff. I don't see how the platforms then can even do their jobs, can service any content. I mean, does it all need to go through the uh, be monitored by a human? Every piece of I mean, it just doesn't. And that's obviously, and I'm asking rhetorically here because you guys know that was obviously the motivating factor behind the creation of Section two thirty in the first place. But I don't understand even if and this all these First Amendment cases we've talked about it throughout this. We talked about it in three hundred three creative. Like there are always going to be edge cases. There are always going to be problems created by allowing for free expression in a free society. Well, but you know, I think I mean there's a very easy answer here, right? I mean because you can ask the same question. How do you keep a boob off of the Super Bowl, right? right? Well, a week later at the Grammys, you come up with this Rube Goldberg-esque, you know, you know, minute-long delay that allows video editing so that between the actual live conduct and the broadcast of it, you know, someone can get in between and blur something. And now, of course, in the wake of all of that, they have much more But the key there is it's a someone. It's like that, you can't right. have human moderation right. on billions so, of pieces so, of online content. Right. And so my point was going to be, yeah – you could have a rule that says, you know, all online you know, publishers must have a delay that allows either a person or AI or something to prevent certain kinds of content. It would be blatantly unconstitutional. And P.S. I'm not even sure you could do that to broadcasters. I mean, there is an indecency rule. Um, but, you know, yeah, there's a way to do it. The question is, is it desirable? Is it constitutional? I think the answer to those questions is no. Well, I, w- I want to turn next, uh, David, I didn't let you in on that, but so please forgive me on that. I want to wrap up here on the trademark cases because there are two trademark cases that raise varying degrees of First Amendment questions but are nonetheless interesting. There's a case, uh, Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts v. Goldsmith, and then there is another case, Jack Daniels Properties v. VIP Products. Two slightly different cases. Uh, let's start with the Andy Warhol case. Um In 1984, after Prince became a superstar, uh, Vanity Fair uh, wanted to publish a piece uh, about Prince in which they commissioned Andy Warhol to create an image of Prince for an article called Purple Fame. And I'm just trying to go through the facts here quickly. Um, They paid for this this woman, Lynn Goldsmith, who's a photographer, for the rights to use that image and then for Andy Warhol to recreate it they published it on their website but in subsequent years andy warhol then made more images based on that original photo that lynn goldsmith took that were not 
licensed by Vanity Fair and were used in other commercial uh, uh, enterprises. And so, of course, um, there are suits and countersuits over, you know, what the license involves there. I, I, the crux of the question for me, I'm a documentary filmmaker, right? Like, what constitutes fair use of an image? And I think the, and I'm just, let me pull up the issue before the court, the question before the court, whether a work of art is transformative when it conveys a different meaning or message from its source material, or whether a court is forbidden from considering the meaning of the accused work where it is, where it recognizably derives from its source material. Now I'll let Aaron, our editor, if you're hearing this, put up an image of the like original photo versus um, the one that Warhol later created separate from the Vanity Fair commission. Um, they look pretty similar to me, but I'm not, I'm not an artist, right? Maybe so. Maybe there is like a message here that I'm missing. I mean, one has color, one doesn't, I believe. Um, one has like more squiggly. I don't know, but like, how are we supposed to think about, and this is constantly a question again, as a documentarian, we're asking, how do we think about fair use? What is transformative? Uh, what is too similar to the original product. David, do you have thoughts there? Well, Nico, that, that's why this case is so important, right? Because there is, and this is a copyright case, there's underlying tension between the First Amendment and copyright law. And, and the way that our legal system has tried to provide uh, and make sure that copyright is truly a, quote, engine of free expression is through two doctrines, the fair use doctrine and the idea expression dichotomy. And if you look at the fair use doctrine, which was, I think, statutorized in the Copyright Act of 1976, there are four factors. We're looking primarily at this first factor, the purpose and use. And there is this concept, and you hit the nail on the head in your recitation, whether something is transformative. If something is transformative, then it adds a whole new layer. It adds a whole new uh, layer of expression. It adds a whole new... Um, you know, it, it's not just the, it, it, this is really an iter, uh, a modern iteration of uh, Campbell versus uh, Roy Acuff back in, uh, when was it, 1994, right? When the two live crew did a parody of Roy Orbison's Pretty Woman, right? And Andy Warhol is very famous for these silkscreen, uh, you know, uh, portraits. Um, and the Second Circuit, I thought, had a bit of a crabbed, uh, application of the uh, of the of the uh, of that first fair use factor and, and I I think what we need to advocate I mean well not let me let me rephrase that I, I think that it's very important that we have a broad understanding of of what is transformative so that we don't have a system that uh, stifles freedom of expression well yeah but, but this is the issue it's like okay when does it cross the line into transformative, particularly in modern art, right? Like you could put a toilet in the middle of a room, not doing anything else to the toilet, but putting it in the middle of that room. And the art is imbued with different meaning as a result of kind of how the artist describes it, right? Like, so, and Andy Warhol, you know, especially in his own time was considered a, 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 um, a, a modern artist, right? The Campbell soup thing. I mean, he's not doing much to this Campbell soup can except drawing it. Uh, like, <laughs> well, they say, you know, Nico, they say bad facts make bad law. Um, and I think this is an example of tough facts make tough law. And I think particularly what's tough about this case is that it involves the static visual arts to go back to your toilet question if you will. <laughs> it could be a banana in the middle of the room. You, you know what I'm or getting Or a banana at. on the wall, whatever it is. You know, you only get copyright protection for the cr copyrightable creative elements in question. So the toilet sitting in the middle of a room, if someone takes the same toilet and puts it in their house in the middle of a room with nothing else, have they infringed that copyright? Well, what's the copyrightable element of the toilet in the middle of the room in the museum to begin with, mm -hmm. right? It's it, it's, yeah, it's probably really not the about, best example. It's really about the no, but it's, I think it's an important point to illustrate this because when it comes to photography and you know uh, static arts like this, you know you've got this picture of Prince and it's a black and white with him against a white background and it's lighted a certain way and she applied his make makeup a certain way and she said she was conveying certain things about it when she took it, and it was an unpublished portrait 
It was licensed as an artist reference for, you know, the, the Condé Nast magazine. She didn't know it was going to be a Warhol. Therefore, she didn't know that it was necessarily going to wind up in 16 different iterations. And then the question is, what does Warhol do to it? Well, Warhol softens the focus. He makes it, you know, dual colors, but in a way that doesn't emphasize the contrasts. And in some cases, it's multiple colors. Now, there are, there are some, and, 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 you know, when you find um, Aaron, the images, they're in the decision, and particularly the district court decision, they show all 16 of the Prince uh, iterations, I'm sorry, the Warhol iterations of Prince. Some of them are black and white, and they are very close to the portrait, and the others are much more stylized. And so the question becomes, what are the copyrightable elements of a photograph? And then what did Andy Warhol do to modify them? And did he do it in a way that is transformative as opposed to being a derivative work? As a documentarian, I think it's easier with motion pictures and you know things that have more complexity and more different moving parts that are copyrightable to say, okay, this is various. This is a very tough case because of the nature of the images involved. And does it become tougher because Condé Nast and Vanity Fair licensed the image? Uh, I forget the phrase you used. It sounded like a term in art, Ronnie, but it licensed the image in the first place. I remember when I was doing the documentary where our lawyer would say, essentially, if you've already reached to the copy, out to the copyright owner to license, to, license the, 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 the piece of work, even if you think you have a strong fair use argument, you probably need to license it at that point, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that's a, that's a rule of thumb. Um, it's, it's also the better safe than sorry. And do you want to create a work that you know may be enjoined and not be able to be distributed later? Of course, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, I, I think. So like, what you're saying here, like, so case. yeah, so if the if the court decides that Andy Warhol's work was transformative enough, then Condé Nast didn't need to license it in the first place, right? Theoretically. Arguably, yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there's another there's another um, trademark case going up to the court. Jack Daniels Properties v. VIP Products. Essentially, VIP Products made <laughs> what was it? A dog toy lampooning a bottle of Jack Daniels whiskey by kind of mirroring its iconic shape and black label. It replaced Jack Daniels with Bad Spaniels and Old Number no. Seven brand tennessee sour mash whiskey with the old number two on your tennessee carpet um after vip products asked a federal court to declare its toy did not infringe jack daniels trademark jack daniels countersued for trademark infringement and trademark dilution which is another concept here um and the ninth circuit before it got up to the supreme court sided with vip products the question here is whether humorous use of another's trademark as one's own on a commercial product is subject to the Lanham Act's traditional likelihood of confusion analysis. I don't know. I wouldn't confuse the two, uh, but that's just me personally. Um, and Or instead receives heightened First Amendment protection from trademark infringement claims. And then there's that second question of trademark dilution. Is a tra trademark diluted by creating these sort of parody products? Which one of you wants to take that that first? David? Well, I, I view it as protected parity more so than, than trademark infringing. I, I don't think that's Is that even a question before the court, though? I mean, I'm not seeing it. I, it, I, actually I is. it is. I, I don't view this as, as, as any way commercially harming Jack Daniels. If anything gets the Jack Daniels. Look, Jack Daniels is not getting harmed. I, I live in Tennessee. Everybody drinks Jack Daniels. Jack and Coke is the favorite drink, right? I mean, like, <laughs> well, what are you just, saying? Are you saying? Are you saying it's that funny? Jack like it's just funny. Like it's funny. The company made it's funny. They don't like it. It's poking fun at them, and they. I I just I, I again I think this is uh, Campbell v. A. Cuff again. I think that's the one similarity. Even though one's a copyright case, one's a trademark case. I think Campbell v. A. Cuff is a primary precedent in both of them. And to me, this is this is just like uh, the two live crew uh, having the different lyrics uh, that are similar to Pretty Woman of Roy Orbison. I, I think it's protected parody. Well, so David says there that Jack Daniels are, is being jackasses. Ronnie, do you agree? Well, Jack, you know, Jack, Jack Daniels is sacred. I mean, don't I mean, don't get me started there. But for, I mean, for our listeners, so they know Ronnie is like the biggest whiskey snob in the office, although he refuses to drink the best kind of whiskey, which is peated scotch whiskey, but we'll leave that for another podcast. Ronnie, I'll let you continue. Yeah, no. So, so the issue in this case is when you have a trademark infringement or trademark dilution case, um, one of two tests is going to apply if there's been an infringement. And it depends on whether the infringement is part of an expressive worker product or a non-expressive worker product. Right. And so that's why whether this squeaky toy 
is speech. Or not. In some ways, this brings us right back around to where we started with 303 is, is this speech or not? Because whether this dog toy is speech dictates which trademark test gets applied. And to me, and I'm, with, I'm, I'm, I'm David's camp here. I mean, I, it is it is parody. It is funny. But for me, it boils down to is forget about Jack Jack Daniels or anything else. Pretend they didn't use Jack Daniels. So pretend it is a unique, you know, made up brand for purposes of this dog toy. Would it be copyrightable? Is it a work of authorship? And I think the answer to that would be clearly yes. Right? You've got you've got you've got expressive design elements in the shape, in the in the text, in the color. And if it's a work of authorship. To me, the speech, and if it's speech, you get the trade, you get the trademark test attributable to speech, and then you get to the questions of is it parody? Will it, you know, will it will it dilute the Jack Daniels uh, image? Will it confuse consumers about the source of the product? Will people think this is a Jack Daniels product as opposed to some someone else's product? And I think here, as David points out, given the way that they've marked this up and made kind of a joke out of the whole thing. I don't think that there's any real risk of that, even though, and this is in the record, Jack Daniels does license its marks for dog collars, leashes, and other dog products. I still don't think, in my opinion, if I were on this jury, that it would be likely to be confused bad spaniels number two on your carpet with Jack Daniels licensing its actual trademarks for a wide variety of products, some of which are dog related. Well, gentlemen, I think we have to leave it there. We've covered a lot from the Supreme Court in 2022. Of course, the term runs through June of 2023. I think it sometimes runs into July as well, depending on how fast they're getting their work done. But I appreciate you both taking the time to talk through the cases. David, Ronnie, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Great pleasure. I hope you'll have me back. Yeah. Well, you're just a couple office over, Ronnie, and I am I know you'll hold me to it. So this podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and recorded and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram by searching for Free Speech Talk. You can like us on Facebook by going to facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. And we also poll, or post, I should say, uh, the full video versions of these episodes to So To Speak's YouTube channel. When we post, or at least moving forward, we will post segments of the show to Fire's YouTube channel, which if you go to uh, at the fire org at YouTube, you can see in the channel section that the so to speak channel is linked there. If you have feedback for the show, email us please, so to speak at the fire.org. We also take reviews at Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Reviews do help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening. Mm-hmm.